Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Tonight, we are getting into a new book. It is entitled, Show Your Work, 10 Ways to Share Your Creativity and Get Discovered, Dis and Get Discovered by Austin Kleon. He's a New York Times bestseller from the author of Steel Like an Artist. So let's dig into this black and yellow bumblebee book for Megan. A new way of operating. Let's get into that. For artists, the great problem to solve is how to get oneself noticed. Hmm, how do I say your name? Honoré de Balzac. <laughs> yeah. B-A-L-Z-A-C. Creativity is not a talent. It is a way of operating. John Cleese. So a new way of operating. When I have the privilege of talking to my readers, the most common questions they ask me are about self-promotion. How do I get my stuff out there? How do I get noticed? How do I find an audience? How did you do it? <clears throat> I hate talking about self-promotion. Comedian Steve Martin famously dodges these questions with the advice, be so good they can't ignore you. If you focus on getting really good, Martin says, people will come to you. I happen to agree. You don't really find an audience for your work. They find you. But it's not enough to be good. In order to be found, you have to be findable. I think there's an easy way of putting your work out there and making it discoverable while you're focusing on getting really good at what you do. Almost all of the people I look up to and try to steal from today, regardless of their profession, have built sharing into their routine. These people aren't, uh, aren't schmoozing at cocktail parties. They're too busy for that. They're cranking away in their studio, their laboratories, or their cubicles. But instead of maintaining absolute secrecy and hoarding their work, they're open about what they're working on, and they're consistently posting bits and pieces of their work, their ideas, and what they're learning online. Instead of wasting their time networking, they're taking advantage of the network. By generously sharing their ideas and their knowledge, they often gain an audience that they can then leverage when they need it for fellowship, feedback, or patronage. I wanted to create a kind of beginner's manual for this way of operating, so here's what I came up with. A book for people who hate the very idea of self-promotion. An alternative, if you will, to self-promotion. I'm going to try to teach you how to think about your work as a never-ending process, how to share your process in a way that attracts people who might be interested in what you do, and how to deal with the ups and downs of putting yourself and your work out in the world. If Steal Like an Artist was a book about stealing influence from other people, this book is about how to influence others by letting them steal from you. Hey, Paradox Fossils, welcome in. <clears throat> imagine if your next boss didn't have you read... Oh, imagine if your next boss didn't have to read your resume because he already reads your blog. Imagine being a student and getting your first gig based on a school project you posted online. Imagine losing your job, but having a social network of people familiar with your work and ready to help you find a new one. Imagine turning a side project or a hobby into your profession because you had a following that could support you. Or imagine something simpler and just as satisfying, spending the majority of your time, energy, and attention practicing a craft, learning a trade, or running a business, while also allowing for the possibility that your, that your work might attract a group of people who share your interests. All you have to do is show your work. So crafting something is a long, uncertain process. A maker should show her work. Ooh, let me show you what this looks like. It's like a blacked out page of a bunch of writing. I can't, dude, I spent hours this morning trying to, um, oh, hey, oops, but that, that works out just fine. Um, let's see here. I got to pull up this next ago thing and zoom in. So this is like you can tell on the side here. It's a it's a whole page of writing and everything is blacked out except for those words that I just read to you. Cool. Uh, my um, 
my composition pro composition professor in college told me, don't be afraid to kill your darlings, <laughs> which is when I see this paper with all those words that are crossed out. Yeah, that's what it makes me think of. <clears throat> Did you? Cool. <laughs> One, you don't have to be a genius. Find a senius, S-C-E-N-I-U-S, looking it up. <laughs> Find a senius, or however you say that word. S-C-E-N-I-U-S. Definition. Um, oh, is it census? No. Intelligence of a whole operation or group of people. Instead of genius, it's senius. Wow. I, I let's see if I can find a pronunciation. <laughs> my lips just started sticking to my teeth. <laughs> Um, pronunciation. It's a blend of scene and genius. Senius. Senius. Cool. I like it. Okay. Back to Zebuk. Find a senius. Give what you have to so oh, give what you have to someone. It may be better than you dare to think. Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. There are a lot of destructive myths about creativity, but one of the most dangerous is the lone genius myth. An individual with superhuman talents appears out of nowhere at certain points in history free of influences or precedent with a direct connection to God or the muse. When inspiration comes, it strikes like a lightning bolt. A light bulb switches on in the head, and then he spends the rest of his time toiling away in his studio, shaping his idea into a finished masterpiece that he releases into the world to great fanfare. If you believe in the lone genius myth, creativity is an antisocial act performed by only a few great figures mostly dead men with names like Mozart, Einstein, or Picasso. The rest of us are left to stand around and gawk in awe at their achievements. There's a healthier way of thinking about creativity that the musician Brian Eno refers to as senius. Under this model, great ideas are often birthed by a group of creative individuals, artists, curators, 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 thinkers, theorists, and other taste taste makers who make up an ecology of talent. If you look back closely at history, many of the people who were, who we think of as lone geniuses were actually part of a whole scene of people who were supporting each other, looking at each other's work, copying from each other, stealing ideas and contributing ideas. Senius doesn't take away from the achievements of those great individuals. It just acknowledges that good work isn't created in a vacuum. And that creativity is always, in some sense, a collaboration, the result of a mind connected to other minds. What I love about the idea of senius is that it makes room in the story of creativity for the rest of us, the people who don't consider ourselves geniuses. Being a valuable part of a senius is not necessarily about how smart or talented you are, but about what you have to contribute, the ideas you share, the quality of your of the connections you make and the conversations you start. We'll picture a, a bust of Beethoven or Beethoven. <laughs> if we forget about genius and think more about how we can nurture and contribute to a senius, 
we can adjust our own expect own expectations and the expectations of the worlds we want to accept us. We can stop asking what others can do for us and start asking what we can do for others. We live in an age where it's easier than ever to join a seniors. The internet is basically a bunch of seniuses connected together, divorced from physical geography. Blogs, social media sites, email groups, discussion boards, forums, they're all the same thing. Virtual scenes where people go to hang out and talk about the things they care about. There's no bouncer, no gatekeeper, and no barrier to entering these scenes. You don't have to be rich, you don't have to be famous, and you don't have to have a fancy resume, resume or a degree from an expensive school. Online, everyone, the artist and the curator, the master and the apprentice, the expert and the amateur, has the ability to contribute something. Okay, cool. This little picture here has the bust of Mozart in the center and all the things that would connect to him. It's like the seven, or is it the six degrees? The six degrees of Kevin Bacon. <laughs> That's good. Be an amateur, an amateur. That's all any of us are, amateurs. We don't live long enough to be anything else. Charlie Chaplin. We're all terrified of being revealed as amateurs, but in fact, today it is the amateur, the enthusiast who pursues her work in the spirit of love. In French, the word means lover. Regardless of the potential for fame, money, or career, who often has the advantage over the who often has the advantage over the professional? Because they have little to lose, amateurs are willing to try anything and share the results. They take chances, experiment, and follow their whims. Sometimes, in the process of doing things in an unprofessional professional way, they make new discoveries. Quote, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, end quote, said Zen monk, Sh uh, hmm, Shunaryu Suzuki. Quote, in the expert's mind, there are few. I don't think I said his name right, but. <laughs> Amateurs are not afraid to make mistakes or look ridiculous in public. They're in love so they don't hesitate to do work that others think of as silly or just plain stupid. The stupidest possible create, creative act is still a creative act, writes Clay, Clay Shir Shirky, writes Clay Shirky in his book, Cognitive Surplus. Hey, Matt Man, welcome. Hey, Bamboo, welcome, y'all. Awesome. <clears throat> Quote, on the spectrum of creative work, the difference between mediocre and the good is vast. Mediocrity is, however, still on the spectrum. You can move from mediocre to good in increments. The real gap is between doing nothing and doing something, end quote. Amateurs know that contributing something is better than contributing nothing. Amateurs might lack formal training, but they're all lifelong learners and they make a point of learning in the open so that others can learn from their failures and successes. Writer David Foster Wallace said that he thought good notification, or he thought that good nonfiction was a chance to quote, watch somewhat, balls, watch somebody reasonably bright, but also reasonably average, pay far closer attention and think at far more length about all sorts of different stuff than most of us have a chance to in our daily lives, end quote. Amateurs fit the same bill. They're just regular people who get obsessed by something and spend a ton of time thinking out loud about it. Sometimes amateurs have more to teach us than experts. Quote, it often happens that two schoolboys can solve difficulties in their work for one another better than the master can, end quote. Wrote author C.S. Lewis, another quote, the fellow pupil can help more than the master because he knows less. The difficulty we went, the difficulty we want him to explain is one he has recently met. The expert met it so long ago, he has forgotten. 
And then here's another one of those um, blacked out pages. I'll read you what it says here in just a sec. Look, the pros are struggling. Put an amateur. Uh oh. Look, the pros are struggling. Put an amateur in. Get out of your league. Defy perfection. Love something more. Mary, welcome in. Awesome. Oh, awesome. Welcome. Look, the, are, the pros are struggling. Put an amateur in. Get out of your league. Defy perfection. Love something more. Watching amateurs at work can also inspire us to attempt the work ourselves. Quote, I saw the Sex Pistols, said N New Order frontman Bernard Sumner. They were terrible. I wanted to get up and be terrible with them. <laughs> End quote. Raw enthusiasm is contagious. The world is changing at such a rapid rate that it's turning us all into amateurs. Even for professionals, the best way to flourish is to retain an amateur spirit and embrace uncertainty and the unknown. When Radiohead frontman from, uh, Tom York was asked what he thought his greatest strength was, he answered, that I don't know what I'm doing. Like one of his hero heroes, Tom Waits, Whenever York feels like his songwriting is getting too comfortable or stale, he'll pick up an instrument he doesn't know how to play and try to write with it. This is yet another trait of amateurs. They'll use whatever tools they can to get their hands on, to try to get their ideas into the world. I'm an artist, man, said John Lennon. Give me a tuba and I'll get you something out of it. <laughs> I love that. The best way to get started on the path to sharing your work is to think about what you want to learn and make a commitment to learning it in the front of and make a commitment to learning it in front of others. Find a seniors, pay attention to what others are sharing, and then start taking note of what they're not sharing. Be on the lookout for voids that you can fill with your own efforts, no matter how bad they are at first. Don't worry for now, but you'll make money or a career off of it. Oh, wait, wait, balls. Why am I struggling so much? Let's try that again. Don't worry for now about how you'll make money or a career off it. Forget about being an expert or a professional and wear your amateurism, your heart, your love on your sleeve. Share what you love and the people who love the same things will find you. You can't find your voice if you don't use it. Find your voice, shout it from the rooftops, and keep doing it until the people that are looking for you find you. Dan Harmon. We're always being told, find your voice. <clears throat> when I was younger, I never really knew what this, what this meant. I used to worry a lot about voice, wondering if I had my own. But now I realize that the only way to find your voice is to use it. It's hardwired, built into you. Talk about the things you love. Your voice will follow. When the late film critic Roger Ebert went through several intense surgeries to treat his cancer, he lost the ability to speak. He lost his voice, physically and permanently. Here was a man who made a great deal of his living by speaking on television, and now he couldn't say a word. In order to communicate with his friends and family, he'd have to either scribble responses on a pad of paper or type on his Mac and have the awkward computer voice read it out loud through his laptop speakers. Wow, I didn't know that happened to Robert Ebert. Or Roger, Roger Ebert. Cut off from everyday conversation, he poured himself into tweeting, posting on Facebook, and blogging at rogerebert.com. He ripped out posts at a breakneck, uh, breakneck speed, writing thousands and thousands of words about everything he could think of. His boyhood in Urbana, Illinois, his love for steak and shake, his conversations with famous movie actors, his thoughts on his inevitable death. Hundreds and hundreds of people would respond to his posts and he would respond back. Blogging became his primary way of communicating with the world. Quote, on the web, my real voice finds expression, end quote, he wrote. Ebert knew this time on this planet was short. Ebert knew his time on this planet was short. And he wanted to share everything he could in the time he had left. 
quote, Mr. Ebert writes as if it were a matter of life and death, wrote journal journalist Janet Maslin, because it is, end quote. Ebert was blogging because he had to blog, because it was a matter of being heard or not being heard, a matter of existing or not existing. It sounds a little extreme, but in this day and age, if your work isn't online, it doesn't exist. We all have the opportunity to use our voices, to have our say, but so many of us are wasting it. If you want people to know about what you do and the things you care about, you have to share. And then we have this little uh, tuba over here. Questions for a new tool. What was it made for? How are others using it? What use can I find for it? This is a quote by Steve Jobs. Remembering that I'll be dead soon is the most important tool I've ever encountered to help me make the big choices in life because almost everything, all external expectations, all pride, all fear of embarrassment or failure, all these things just fall away in the face of death, leaving only what is truly important. Remembering that you are going to die is the best way to know, is the best way I know to avoid the trap of thinking you have something to lose. You are already naked. Wow. Steve Jobs. Read obituaries. If all this sounds scary or like a lot of work, consider this. One day you'll be dead. Most of us prefer to ignore this most basic fact of life. But thinking about our inevitable end has a way of putting everything into perspective. We've all read stories of near-death experiences changing people's lives. When George Lucas was a teenager, he almost died in a car accident. He decided, every day now is an extra day. Dedicated himself to film and went on to direct Star Wars. Wayne Coyne, lead singer of The Flaming Lips, was 16 when he was held up while working at a Long John Silver's. Quote, I realized I was going to die, he says. And when that gets into your mind, it utterly changed me. I thought, I'm not going to sit here and wait for things to happen. I'm going to make them happen. And if people think I'm an idiot, I don't care. Uh, Tim Kreider, in his book, We Learn Nothing, says that getting stabbed in the throat was the best thing to ever happen to him. For a whole year, he was happy and life was good. Quote, You'd like to think that nearly getting killed would be a permanently life-altering experience, Kreider writes, but the illumination didn't last, end quote. Eventually, he was back to the busy work of living. <clears throat> the writer George Saunders, speaking of his own near-death experience, said, For three or four days after that, it was the most beautiful world. To have gotten back to have gotten back in it, you know? And I thought, if you could walk around like that all the time to really have that awareness that it's actually going to end, that's the trick. Hmm. Unfortunately, I'm a coward. As much as I would like the existential euphoria that comes with it, I don't really want a near-death experience. I want to stay safe and stay away from death as much as I can. I certainly don't want to taunt it or count it. Oh, bollocks. I certainly don't want to taunt it or court it or invite it any closer than it needs to be. But I do somehow want to remember that it's coming for me. It's for this reason that I read the obituaries every morning. Obituaries are like near-death experiences for cowards. Reading them is a way for me to think about death while also keeping it at arm's length. Obituaries aren't really about death, they're about life. The sum of every obituary is how heroic people are and how noble, writes artist Maria Kalman. Reading about people who are dead now and did things with their lives makes me want to get up and do something decent with mine. Thinking about death every morning makes me want to live. A near-death experience for the rest of us. Try it. 
Start reading the obituaries every morning. Take inspiration from the people who muddled through life before you. They all started out as amateurs and they got where they were going by making do with what they were given and having the guts to put themselves out there. Follow their example. Two, think process, not product. Pull back the curtain on your process. Anne Friedman. Take people behind the scenes. When a painter talks about her work, she could be talking about two different things. There's the artwork, the finished piece, framed and hung on the gallery wall. And there's the artwork, the, all the day-to-day -day stuff that goes on behind the scenes in her studio. Looking for inspiration, getting an idea, applying oil to a canvas, etc. There's painting, the noun, and there's painting, the verb as in all kinds of work. There is a distinction between the painter's process and the products of her process. Traditionally, the artist has been trained to regard her creative process as something that should be kept, kept to herself. This way of thinking is articulated by David Bales and Ted Orland in their book, Art and Fear. Quote, to all viewers but yourself, what matters is the product, the finished artwork, to you and you alone, what matters is the process, the experience of shaping the artwork, end quote. The artist is, is supposed to toil in secrecy, keeping her ideas and her work under lock and key, waiting until she has a magnificent product to show for herself before she tries to connect with an audience. Quote, the private detail of art making are utterly uninteresting to audiences, end quote, write Bales and Orland. Quote, because they're almost never visible or even knowable from examining the finished work, end quote. <clears throat> we got another one. The work is all that's happened in the day. It is a process, not a thing. This all made sense in a pre-digital age when the only way an artist could connect with an audience was through a gallery show or write-up in some fancy art magazine. But today, by taking advantage of the internet and social media, an artist can share whatever she wants, whenever she wants, at almost no cost. She can decide exactly how much or how little of her work and herself she will share. And she can be as open about her process as she wants to. She can share her sketches and work in, works in progress, post pictures of her studio, or blog about her influences, inspiration, and tools. By sharing her day-to-day -day process, the things she really cares about she can form a unique bond with her audience. To many artists, particularly those who grew up in the pre-digital era, this kind of openness and the potential vulnerability that goes along with sharing one's process is a terrifying idea. Here's the author Edgar Allan Poe writing in 1846, quote, most writers, poets in a special, prefer having it understood that they compose by a, by a species of fine frenzy, an ecstatic intuition and would positively shudder at letting the public take a peep behind the scenes, end quote. <laughs> but human beings are interested in other human beings and what other human beings do. Quote, people really do want to see how the sausage gets made, end quote. That's how designer designers Don Provost, 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 P-R-O-V-O-S-T, and Tom Gerhardt put it in their book, Entrepreneurship, It Will Be Exhilarating. Quote, by putting things out there consistently, you can form a relationship with your customers. It allows them to see the person behind the products, end quote. Audiences not only want to stumble across great work, but they too long to be creative and part of the creative process. By letting go of our egos and sharing our process, we allow for the possibility of people having an ongoing connection with us and our work, with, uh, which helps us move more of our product. And let me say, process is messy. And then on this page, it says, in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen, really seen. Bren Brown. Become a documentarian of what you do. In 2013, the internet fell in love with 
astronaut Chris Hadfield, commander of the International Space Station. Three years earlier, Hadfield and his family were sitting around the dinner table trying to figure out ways to generate in interest for the Canadian Space Agency, which, like many space programs, faced major budget cuts and needed more public support. Quote, Dad wanted a way to help people connect with the real side of what an astronaut's life is, said Hadfield's son, Evan. Not just the glamour and science, but also the day-to-day -day activities, end quote. Hey, welcome in, Faye. Good to see you. Commander Hadfield wanted to show his work. Things fell into place when his sons explained social media to him and got him set up on Twitter and other social networks. During his next five-month mission, while performing all his regular ast or astronautical duties, he tweeted, answered questions from his followers, posted pictures he'd taken of Earth, recorded music, and filmed YouTube videos of himself clipping his nails, brushing his teeth, sleeping, and even performing maintenance on the space station. Millions of people ate it all up, including my agent, Ted, who tweeted, wouldn't normally watch live video of a couple of guys doing plumbing repair, but it's in space. Maybe. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, let's face it. We're not all artists or astronauts. A lot of us go about our work and feel like we have nothing to show for it at the end of the day. But whatever the nature of your work, there is an art to what you do. And there are people who would be interested in that art if only you presented it to them in the right way. In fact, sharing your process might actually be most valuable if the products of your work aren't easily shared. If you're still in the apprentice stage of your work, if you can't just slap up a portfolio and call it a day, or if your process doesn't necessarily lead to tangible finished products. How can you show your work even when you have nothing to show? The first step is to scoop up the scratches, or no, the scraps and the residue of your process and shape them into some interesting bit of media that you can share. You have to turn the invisible into something other people can see. Quote, you have to make stuff, said journalist David Carr, when he was asked if he had any advice for students. Quote, no one is going to give a damn about your resume. They want to see what you have made with your own little fingers, end quote. Become a documentarian of what you do. Start a work journal. Write your thoughts down in a notebook or speak them into an audio recorder. Keep a scrapbook. Take a lot of photographs of your work at different stages in your progress. Shoot video of you working. This isn't about making art. It's about simply keeping track of what's going on around you. Take advantage of all of the cheap, easy tools at your disposal. These days, most of us carry a fully functional multimedia studio around in our smartphones. Whether you share it or not, documenting and recording your process as you go along has its own re rewards. You'll start to see the work you're doing more clearly and feel like you're making progress. And when you're ready to share, you'll have a surplus of material to choose from. And then on this page, it says research, reference, drawings, plans, sketches, interviews, audio, photographs, video, pin boards, journals, drafts, prototypes, demos, diagrams, notes, inspiration, scrapbooks, stories, and collections. <clears throat> Three, share something small every day. Put yourself and your work out there every day and you'll start meeting some amazing people. Bobby Solomon. Send out a daily dispatch. Overnight success is a myth. Dig into almost every overnight success story and you'll find about a decade's worth of hard work and perseverance. Building a substantial body of work takes a long time, a lifetime really. But thankfully, you don't need that time all in one big chunk. So forget about decades, forget about years, and forget about months. Focus on days. The day is the only unit of time that you can really get my head around. Seasons change, weeks are completely human made, but the day has a rhythm. The sun goes up, the sun goes down. I can handle that. Hey, Pearl, welcome in. <clears throat> Let me cough one second here.
Hopefully that did it. The sun goes up, the sun goes down. I can handle that. Once a day, after, you, after you've done your day's work, go back to your documentation and find one little piece of your process that you can share. Where you are in your, pro, in your process will determine what that piece is. If you're in the very early stages, share your influences and what's inspiring you. If you're in the middle of ex executing a project, write about your methods and share your works in progress. If you've just completed a project, show the final pro project. Share scraps from the cutting room floor or write about what you learned. If you have lots of projects out into the world, you can report on how they're doing. You can tell stories about how people are interacting with your work. A daily dispatch is even better than a resume or a portfolio because it shows what you're working on right now. When the artist Z. Frank was interviewing job candidates, he complained, when I ask them to show me work, they show me things from school or from another job, but I'm more interested in what they did last weekend. All right, day one and one month. Day one, one month. One year. <laughs> <clears throat> a daily dispatch is like getting all the DVD extras before a movie comes out. You get to watch deleted scenes and listen to director's commentary while the movie is being made. The form of what you share doesn't matter. Your daily dispatch can be anything you want, a blog post, an email, a tweet, a YouTube video, or some other little bit of media. There's no one size fits all plan for everybody. Social media sites are the perfect place to share daily updates. Don't worry about being on every platform. Pick and choose based on what you do and the people you're trying to reach. Filmmakers hang out on YouTube or Vimeo. Business people, for some strange reason, love LinkedIn. Writers love Twitter. Visual artists tend to like Tumblr, Instagram, or Facebook. The landscape is continuously changing, and new platforms are always popping up and disappearing. Don't be afraid to be an early adopter. Jump on a new platform and see if there's something interesting you can do with it. If you can't find a good use for a platform, feel free to abandon it. Use your creativity. Film critic Tommy Edison, who's been blind since birth, takes photos of his day-to-day -day life and posts them on Instagram under at blind film critic. He's followed by more than 30,000 people. A lot of social media is just about typing into boxes. What you type into the box often demands, uh, depends on the prompt. Facebook asks, Facebook asks you to indulge yourself with questions like, how are you feeling? Or what's on your mind? Twitter's is hardly better. What's happening? I like the tagline at dribble.com. What are you working on? Stick to that question and you'll be good. Don't show your lunch or your latte. Show your work. Don't worry about everything you post being perfect. Science fiction writer Theodore Sturgeon once said that 90% of everything is crap. The same is true of our own work. The trouble is we don't always know what's good and what sucks. That's why it's important to get things in front of others and see how they react. Quote, sometimes you don't always know what you've got says writer Wayne White, quote, continuing, it really does need a little social chemistry to make it show itself to you sometimes. And then here's um, Sturgeon's Law in a, um, in a pie graph. Crap and not crap. Don't say you don't have enough time. We're all busy, but we all get 24 hours a day. People often ask me, how do you find the time for all this? And I answer, I look for it. You find time the same place you find spare change, in the nooks and crannies. You find it in the cracks between the big stuff, your commute, your lunch break, the few hours after your kids go to bed. You might have to miss an episode of your favorite TV show. You might have to miss an hour of sleep but you can find the time if you look for it. I like to work while the world is sleeping and share while the world is at work. Of course, don't let sharing your work take precedence over actually doing your work. If you're having a hard time balancing the two, 
just set a timer for 30 minutes. Once the timer goes off, kick yourself off the internet and get back to work. Quote, one day at a time. It sounds so simple. It actually is simple, but it isn't easy. It requires incredible support and fastidious structuring. End quote. Russell Brand? Nice. <clears throat> one, one moment at a time. Cool. I like that kismet. That's awesome. The so what test. Make no mistake. This is not your diary. You are not letting in. You are not letting it all hang out. You are picking and choosing every single word. Danny Shapiro. Always remember that anything you post to the internet is has now become public. Quote, the internet is a copy machine, writes author Kevin Kelly. Once anything that can be copied is brought into contact with the internet, it will be copied. And those copies never leave, end quote. Ideally, you want the work you post online to be copied and spread to every corner of the internet. So don't post things online that you're not ready for everyone in the world to see. As publicist Lauren Serland says, quote, Post as though everyone who can read it has the power to fire you, end quote. <laughs> Be open. Share imperfect and unfinished work that you want feedback on, but don't share absolutely everything. There's a big, big difference between sharing and oversharing. The act of sharing is one of generosity. You're putting something out there because you think it might be helpful or entertaining to someone on the other side of the screen. I had a professor in college who returned our graded essays, walked up to the chalkboard, and wrote in huge letters, quote, so what, question mark. She threw the piece of chalk down and said, ask yourself that every time you turn in a piece of writing. It's a lesson I never forgot. Always be sure to run everything you share with others through the so what test. Don't overthink it. Just go with your gut. If you're unsure about whether to share something, let it sit for 24 hours. Put it in a drawer and walk out the door. The next day, take it out and look at it, look at it with fresh eyes. Ask yourself, is this helpful? Is this entertaining? Is it something I'd be comfortable with my boss or my mother seeing? There's nothing wrong with saving things for later. The save as draft button is like a prophylactic. Oh, prophylactic. It might not feel as good in the moment, but you'll be glad you lose, used it in the morning. <laughs> okay, so what to show? And then it says, dogs, cats, babies, selfies, sunsets, lunches, lattes, and work. And everything is crossed out except for work, which is circled. <clears throat> hey, Jackie, welcome. Yeah, I had a, um, a later day but I still wanted to go live and I still wanted to read this. So I did. <laughs> should I, should I share this? Is it useful or interesting? Yes. Share it. No. Toss it. I don't know. Save it for later. Turn your flow into stock. If you work on something a little bit every day, you end up with something that is massive. Kenneth Goldsmith. Stock and flow is an economic concept that writer Robin Sloan has adapted into a metaphor for media. Quote, flow is the feed. It's the posts and the tweets. It's the stream of daily and sub-daily updates, updates that remind people you exist. Stock is the durable stuff. It's the content you produce that's as interesting in two months or two years as it is today. It's what people discover via search. It's what spreads slowly but surely, building fans over time, end quote. Sloan says the magic formula is to maintain your flow while working on your stock in the background. In my experience, your stock is best made by collecting, organizing, and expanding upon your flow. Social media sites function a lot like public notebooks. They're places where we think out loud, let other people think back at us, then hopefully think some more. But 
the thing about keeping notebooks is that you have to revisit them in order to make the most out of them. You have to flip back through old ideas to see what you've been thinking. All right, here's a picture of flow versus stock. I like it. We're getting somewhere, right? <clears throat> Piecing it together. Once you make sharing part of your daily routine, you'll notice themes and trends emerging in what you share. You'll find patterns in your flow. When you detect these patterns, you can start gathering these bits and pieces and turn them into something bigger and more substantial. You can turn your flow into stock. For example, a lot of the ideas in this book started out as tweets, which then became blog posts, which then became book chapters. Small things over time can get big. Build a good domain name, and domain is in parentheses. Build a good name. Carving out a space for yourself online, somewhere where you can express yourself and share your work, is still one of the best possible investments you can make with your time. Andy Bao, B A I O. Mm -hmm. Social networks are great, but they come and go. Remember MySpace, Friendster, Geosites? If you're really interested in sharing your work and expressing yourself, nothing beats owning your own space online, a space that you control, a place that no one can take away from you, a world headquarters where people can always find you. More than 10 years ago, I started my own little internet claim and bought the domain named, uh, bought the domain name austincleon.com. I was a complete amateur with no skills when I began building my website. It started off bare bones and ugly. Eventually, I figured out how to install a blog, and that changed everything. A blog is the ideal machine for turning flow into stock. One little blog post is nothing on its own, but publish a thousand blog posts over a decade, and it turns into your life's work. My blog has been my sketchbook, my studio, my gallery, my storefront, and my salon. Absolutely everything good that has happened in my career can be tracked back to my blog. My books, my art shows, my speaking gigs, some of my best friendships, they all exist because I have my own little piece of turf on the internet. Hey, Genevieve, welcome in. Bonsoir. Awesome. <clears throat> so if you can get one thing out of this book, make it this, go register a domain name by www.insertyournamehere.com. If your name is common or you don't like your name, come up with a pseudonym or an alias and register that. Then buy some web hosting and build a website. These things, these things sound technical, but they're really not. A few Google searches and some books from the library will show you the way. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you don't have the time or inclination to build your own site, there's a small army of web designers ready to help you. Your website doesn't have to look pretty. It just has to exist. Don't think of your website as a self-promotion machine. Think of it as a self-invention machine. Online, you can become the person you really want to be. Fill your website with your work and your ideas and the stuff you care about. Go on Google me. Go on Google me. <laughs> Same theme, a whole page blacked out with just the letters that are the words inside that are left. Easy for me to say. <laughs> Mr. Hugh, yay, welcome, awesome -o. Awesome. Over the years, you will be tempted to you will be tempted to abandon it for the newest, shiniest social network. Don't give in. Don't let it fall into neglect. Think about it in the long term. Stick with it, maintain it, and let it change with you over time. When she was young and starting out, Patty Smith got this advice from William Burroughs. Ooh, quote, build a good name. Keep your name clean. Don't make compromises. Don't worry about making a bunch of money or being successful. Be concerned with doing good work. And if you can build a good name, eventually that name will be its own currency. End quote. That's a goodie. The beauty of owning your own turf is that you can do whatever you want with it. Your domain name is your domain. You don't have to make compromises. 
Build a good domain name, keep it clean, and eventually it will be its own currency. Whether people show up or they don't, you're out there doing your thing, ready when, ready whenever they are. Cool. Four, open up your cabinet of curiosities. Your cabinet of curiosities. Moop. The problem with hoarding is you end up living off your reserves. Eventually, you'll become stale. If you give away everything you have, you're left with nothing. This, is, this forces you to look, to be aware, to replenish. Excuse me. Somehow, the more you give away, the more comes back to you. Paul Arden. <laughs> that way! Woo, woo, woo! Awesome, everybody! Don't be a hoarder. If you happen to be wealthy and educated and alive in 16th and 17th century Europe, it was fashionable to have a wonder, wonder, a wonder cam, cameron, wonder cameron, or a wonder chamber, chamber, or a cabinet of curiosities in your house, a room filled with rare and remarkable objects that served as a kind of external display of your thirst for knowledge of this world. Inside a cabinet of curiosities, you might find books, skeletons, jewels, shells, art, plants, minerals, taxidermy specimens, stones, or any other exotic artifact. That's what I want my whole apartment to look like. <laughs> These collections often juxtaposed both natural and human-made marvels, revealing a kind of mashup of handiwork by both God and human beings. They were a precursor to what we think of today as the modern museum, a place dedicated to the study of history, nature, and the arts. Ooh, look at this. Okay, I'm actually going to zoom this in so you can see this picture. Look at all the stuff on the walls. Wow. And the ceiling. Cool. We all have our own treasured collections. They can be physical cabinets of curiosity, say living room bookshelves full of our favorite novels, records, and movies. Or they can be more like intangible museums of the heart. Our schools lined with memories of places we've been, people we've met, experiences we've accumulated. We all carry around the weird and wonderful things we've come across while doing our work and living our lives. These mental scrapbooks form our tastes and our tastes influence our work. There's not a big, there's not as big of a difference between collecting and creating as you might think. A lot of the writers I know see the act of reading and the act of writing as existing on opposites and opposite ends of the same spectrum. The reading feeds the writing, which feeds the reading. I'm basically a curator, says the writer and former bookseller Jonathan Lethem. Quote, making books has always felt very connected to my bookselling experience that of wanting to draw people's attention to the things that I liked, to shape things that I liked into new shapes, end quote. Our tastes make us what we are, but they are also cast, but they also, rather, let's try again. Our tastes make us what we are, but they can also cast a shadow over our work. Quote, all of us who do creative work, we get into it because we have good taste quote, end quote, says public radio personality Ira Glass. And then the quote continues. But there is this gap. For the first couple years, you make stuff. It's just not that good. It's trying to be good. It has potential, but it's not. But your taste, the thing that got you into the game, is still killer, end quote. Before we're ready to take the leap of sharing our own work with the world, we can share our tastes in the work of others. Where do you get your inspiration? What sorts of things do you fill, with, fill your head with? What do you read? Do you subscribe to anything? 
What sites do you visit on the internet? What music do you listen to? What movies do you see? Do you look at art? What do you collect? What's inside your scrapbook? What do you pin to the corkboard above your desk? What do you stick on your refrigerator? Who's done work that you admire? What do you steal ideas from? Do you have any heroes? Who do you follow online? Who are the practitioners you look up to in your field? Your influences are all worth sharing because they clue people in to who you are and what you do, sometimes even more than your own work. Quote, you're only as good as your record collection, end quote. DJ Spooky. <laughs> No guilty pleasures. I don't believe in guilty pleasures. If you're, if you're, oh, no, no, okay. <clears throat> it's the F word. Um, quote, I don't believe in guilty pleasures. If you fucking like something, like it. Dave Grohl. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> About 20 years ago, a trash man in New York City named Nelson Molina started collecting little bits and pieces of art and unique objects that he found discarded, discarded along his route. His collection, the Trash Museum, is housed on the second floor of the Sanitation Department garage on East 99th Street, and it now features more than a thousand paintings, posters, photographs, musical instruments, toys, and other ephemera. There isn't a big unifying principle to the collection, just what Molina likes. He gets submissions from some of his fellow workers, but he says what goes on the wall and what doesn't. Oh, but he says, but he says what goes on the wall and what doesn't. Quote, I tell the guys, just bring it in and I'll decide if I can hang it, end quote. At some point, Molina painted a sign for the museum that reads, Treasure in the Trash by Nelson Molina. Dumpster diving is one of the jobs of the artists, finding the treasure in other people's trash sifting through the debris of our culture, paying attention to the stuff that everyone else is ignoring, and taking inspiration from the stuff that people have tossed aside for whatever reasons. More than 400 years ago, M um, Michel de M Mon... Mm. Michel de, uh, de Montagny, in his essay on experience, wrote, quote, in my opinion, the most ordinary things, the most common and familiar, if we could see them in their true light, would turn out to be the grandest miracles and the most marvelous examples, end quote. All it takes to uncover hidden gems is a clear eye, an open mind, and a willingness to search for inspiration in places other people aren't willing or able to go. And then we got a picture here. Notice, do not dump rubbish or garbage. When you find things you genuinely enjoy, don't let anyone else make you feel bad about it. Don't feel guilty about the pleasure you take in the things you enjoy. Celebrate them. How to be exceptional. The first step is to stop trying. When you share your taste and your influences, have the guts to own all of it. Don't give into the pressure of don't give into the pressure to self-edit too much. Don't be the lame guys at the record store arguing over who's the most authentic punk rock band. Don't try to be hip or cool. Being open and honest about what you like is the best way to connect with people who like those things too. Do what you do best and link to the rest. Jeff Jarvis. Credit is always due. If you share the work of others, it's your duty to make sure that the creators of that work get proper credit. Crediting work in our copy and paste age of reblogs and retweets can seem like a futile effort, but it's worth it. And it's the right thing to do. You should always share, your, share the work of others as if it were your own. Treating it with respect. Wait, wait. You should always share the work of others as if it were your own treating it with respect and care. When we make the case for crediting our sources, most of us concentrate on the plight of the original creator of the work. But that's only half of the story. 
If you fail to properly attribute work that you share, you not only rob the person who made it, you rob all the people you've shared it with. Without, a tr um, how do I say this word? Attribute, attribution. Without attribution, they have no way to dig deeper into the work or find more of it. Boom. So what makes for great attribution? Attribution is all about providing context for what you're sharing, what the work is, who made it, how they made it, when and where it was made, why you're sharing it, why people should care about it, and where people can see some, some more work like it. Attribution is about putting little museum labels next to the stuff you share. Another form of attribution that we often neglect is where we found the work that we're sharing. It's always good practice to give a shout out to people who've helped you stumble up stumble onto good work and also leave a breadcrumb trail that people you're sharing with can follow back to the sources of your inspiration. I've come across so many interesting people online by following via and h slash t, which I don't know what h slash t means. <laughs> so let's see here, attribution. What is it? Who made it and when? Why we should care, how you found it, where, we can find more things like it. Oh, H slash T links. I'd have been robbed of a lot of these connections if it weren't for the generosity and meticulous attribution of many of the people I follow. Online, the most important form of attribution is a hyperlink. Oh, maybe that's what that is, H, maybe. HT, I'm not sure, is a hyperlink posting back to the website of the creator of the work. This sends people who come across the work back to the original source. The number one rule of the internet, people are lazy. If you don't include a link, no one can click on it. <clears throat> no one can click it. Attribution without a link online borders on useless. 99.9% .9 of people are not going to bother Googling someone's name. All of this raises the question, what if you want to share something and you don't know where it came from or who made it? The answer, don't share things you can't properly credit. Find the right credit or don't share. I like that. Okay, five. I'm going to read one more chapter and then and then I'll read this the rest of this book um, the next time I go live with it. Tell good stories. Five. Work doesn't speak for itself. Close your eyes and imagine you're a wealthy collector who's just entered a gallery and an, a gallery in an art museum. On the wall facing you, there are two gigantic canvases, each more than 10 feet tall. Both paintings depict a harbor at sunset. From across the room, they look identical the same ships, the same reflections on the water, the same sun at the same stage of setting. You go in for a closer look. You can't find a label or a museum tag anywhere. You become obsessed with the painting, which you nickname painting A and painting B. You spend an hour going back and forth from canvas to canvas, co comparing brushstrokes. You can't detect a single difference. Just as you go to fetch a museum guard or someone who can shed light on these mysterious twin masterpieces, the head curator of the museum walks in. You eagerly inquire as to the origins of your new obsessions. The curator tells you that painting A was painted in the 17th century by a Dutch master. And what of painting B, you asked? Ah, yes, painting B, the curator says. That's a forgery. It was copied last week by a graduate student at the local art college. Look up the painting. Which canvas looks better now? Which one do you want to take home? Art forgery is a strange phenomenon. Quote, you might think that the pleasure you get from a painting depends on its color and its shape and its pattern, says psychology professor Paul Bloom, and continuing goes on. And if that's right, it shouldn't matter, matter whether it's an original or a forgery, end quote. But our brains don't work that way. Quote, when shown an object or given food or given a food or shown a face, people's assessment of it, how much they like it, how valuable it is, is deeply affected by what you tell them about it. 
Hmm. End quote. <clears throat> In their book, Significant Objects, Joshua Glenn and Rob Walker recount an experiment in which they set out to test this hypothesis. Quote, stories are such a powerful driver of emotional value that their effect on any given object's sub, uh, subject, I know how to say this, subjective. <laughs> uh, let's see, stories are such a powerful driver of emotional value that their effect on any given object's subjective value can actually be measured objectively, end quote. First, they went out to thrift stores, flea markets, and yard sales and bought a bunch of insignificant objects for an average of 125 an object. Then they hired a bunch of waiters, both famous and not so famous, to invent a story that attributed significance to each object. Dang it, one second, I gotta cough. Boop. Finally, they listed each object on eBay using the invented stories as the object's description and whatever they had originally paid for the object as the auction's starting price. By the end of the experiment, they had sold $128.74 worth of trinkets for $3,612.51. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Words matter. Artists love to trot out the tired line, my work speaks, speaks for itself. But the truth is, our work doesn't speak for itself. Human beings want to know where things come from, where they came from, how they were made, and who made them. The stories you tell about the work you do have a huge effect on how people feel and what they understand about your work. And how people feel and what they understand about your work affects how they value it. There's a quote over here. It says, To fake a photograph, all you have to do is change the caption. To fake a painting, change the attribution. Errol Morris. Quote, Why should we describe the frustrations and turning points in the lab? or all the hours of groundwork and failed images that precede the final outcomes? Asks Rachel S Sussman. Continuing the quote, it says, because rarefied expectations aside, our audience is a human one and humans want to connect. Personal stories can make the complex more tangible, spark associations and offer entry into things that might otherwise leave one cold, end quote. Cool. I like that quote. Um, pictures can say whatever we want them to say. Mountain, shark fin, stalagmite, wizard hat, tortilla chip. Your caption goes here. <laughs> They're all triangles. <laughs> I love it. Mountain, shark fin, stalagmite. Stalagmites, they're the ones that go up. Stalact stalactite, go down. I can't, I always struggle to remember that. Your work doesn't exist in a vacuum. Whether you realize it or not, you're already telling a story about your work. Every email you send, every text, every conversation, every blog comment, every tweet, every photo, every video, they're all bits and pieces of a multimedia narrative you're constantly constructing. If you want to be more effective when sharing yourself and your work, you need to become a better storyteller. You need to know what a good story is and how to tell one. Quote, the cat sat on mat. The, oh, the cat sat on a mat is not a story. The cat sat on the dog's mat is a story. John Lacar. <laughs> Structure is everything. Don Harmon or Dan Harmon's story circle. One, a character is in a zone of comfort. Two, but they want something. 
Three, they enter an unfamiliar situation. Four, adapt to it. Five, get what they wanted. Six, pay a heavy price for it. Seven, return to their familiar situation. Eight, having changed. And back to the beginning of the bullseye. And then under structure is everything is this quote that says, in the first act, you get your hero up in up a tree. The second act, you throw rocks at him. For the third act, you let him down. George Abbott. <laughs> Sweet dreams, Mr. Hugh. Awesome. Great to see you. The most important part of a story is its structure. A good story structure is tidy, sturdy, and logical. Unfortunately, most of life is messy, uncertain, and illogical. A lot of our raw experiences don't fit neatly into a traditional fairy tale or a Hollywood plot. Sometimes we have to do a lot of cropping and editing to fit our lives into something that resembles a story. If you study the structure of stories, you start to see how they work. And once you know how they work, you can then start stealing story structures and filling them in with characters, situations, and settings from your own life. Most story structures can be traced back to myths and fairy tales. Emma Coates, a former storyboard artist at Pixar, outlined the basic structure of a fairy tale as a kind of mad lib that you can fill in with your own elements. Once upon a time, there was blank. Every day, blank. One day, blank. Because of that, blank. Because of that, blank. Until finally, blank. Pick your favorite story and try to fill in the blanks. It's striking how often it works. Cool. Page 98. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that I want, as soon as I finish reading here. Philosopher Aristotle said a story had a beginning, a middle, and an end. Author John Gardner said the basic plot of nearly all stories is this, quote, a character wants something, goes after it despite opposition, perhaps including his own doubts, and so arrives at a win, lose, or draw, end quote. I like Gardner's plot formula because it's also the shape of most creative work. You get, an, you get a great idea, you go through the hard work of executing the idea, and then you release the idea out into the world, coming to a win, lose, or draw. Sometimes the idea succeeds, sometimes it fails, and more often than not, it does nothing at all. The simple formula can be applied to almost any type of work project. There's the initial problem, the work done to solve the problem, and the solution. Of course, when you're in the middle of a story, as most of us are in life, you don't know if it's a story at all, because you don't know how far into it you are, and you don't know how it's going to end. Fortunately, there's a way to tell open-ended stories where we acknowledge that we're smack dab in the middle of a story, and we don't know how it all ends. Kurt Vonnegut's story graphs. This was a page I opened up to last night when I was looking through this. Okay, I'll um, zoom it up so that we can see it more clearly together. The beginning, the end. Good Fortune has that just that, that big dip to the up. And then it says, what does that say? Man in the hole. <laughs> Oh my gosh, look at Cinderella's. It's a bunch of steps, and then she drops down until she rises up. Kafka's what? Kaf Kafka's metamorphosis. Oh, just down. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Boop. Okay. Every client presentation, every personal essay, every cover letter, every fundraising request, they're all pitches. They're stories with the endings chopped off. A good pitch is set up, to, is set up in three acts. The first act is the past. The second act is the present. And the third act is the future. The first act is where you've been, what you want, how you came to want it, and what you've done so far to get it. The second act is where you are now in your work and how you've worked hard and used up most of your resources. 
The third act is where you're going and how exactly the person you're pitching can help you get there. Like a choose your own adventure book, this story shape effectively turns your listener into a hero who gets to decide how it ends. I love those stories. I love those picks. Pick your choose your own adventure books. Man, I love those. <laughs> I like that. I didn't mean to click that, but that was cool. Thank you. Whether you're telling a finished or unfinished story, always keep your audience in mind. Speak to them directly and in plain language. Value their time. Be brief. Learn to speak. Learn to write. Use spell check. You're never keeping it real with your lack of proofreading and punctuation. You're keeping it unintelligible. <laughs> Everybody loves a good story, but good storytelling doesn't come easy to everybody. It's a skill that takes a lifetime to master. So study the great stories and then go find some of your own. Your stories will get better the more you tell them. Gustav Freytag's Pyramid. All right, let's look. Climax. Oh, wait, one, exposition, two, inciting incident, three, climax, four, resolution, five, denouncement, or denouement. I don't know what that means. A five act structure. Denouement. Denouement? We're looking it up. Let me get this out of here. My cat just went to the bathroom, if you can hear that. <laughs> She's scratching. <laughs> okay, so denouement. D-E-N-O-U-E-M-E-N-T. Denouement. Cool. I wonder if it's French. Denouement. The final part of a play, movie, or narrative in which the strands of the plot are drawn together and matters are explained or resolved. Denouement. This is a great word. Denouement. Denouement. I love that. So exposition inciting instant incident then we have rising action climax falling action resolution denouement ah, i love it Woo, baby that was a stanky one you gotta make your case kanye west talk about yourself at parties We've all been there. You're standing at a party, enjoying your drink, when a stranger approaches, introduces herself, and asks the dreaded question, so what do you do? If you happen to be a doctor or a teacher or a lawyer or a plumber, congratulations. You may proceed without caution. For the rest of us, we're going to need to practice our answers. Artists have it the worst. If you answer, I'm a writer, for example, there's a very good chance that the next question will be, oh, have you published anything? which is actually a veiled way of asking, do you make any money off that? <laughs> they want to get over the awkwardness. Oh, the way to get over the awkwardness in these situations is to stop treating them as interrogations and start treating them as opportunities to connect with someone by honestly and humbly explaining what it is that you do. You should be able to explain your work in a, to a kindergartner, a senior citizen and everybody in between. Of course, you always need to keep your audience in mind. The way you explain your work to your buddies at the bar is not the way you explain your work to your mother. Excuse me. Just because you're trying to tell a good story about yourself doesn't mean you're inventing fiction. Stick, stick to nonfiction. Tell the truth and tell it with dignity and self-respect. If you're a student, say you're a student. If you work a day job, say you work a day job. For years, I said, by day, I'm a web designer, and by night, I write, I write poetry. 
If you have a weird hybrid job, say something like, I'm a writer who draws. I stole that bio from the cartoonist Saul Steinberg. If you're unemployed, say so and mention what kind of work you're looking for. If you're employed, but you don't feel good about your job title, ask yourself why that is. Maybe you're in the wrong line of work, or maybe you're not doing the work you're supposed to be doing. There were many years where answering, I'm a writer, felt wrong because I wasn't actually writing. Remember that, or remember what the author George Orwell wrote, quote, autobiography is only to be trusted when it reveals something disgraceful, end quote. Oh, this other picture. Hello, my name is blank. I just heard Slim Shady in my head. Okay. Have empathy for your audience. Anticipate blank stares. Be ready for more questions. Answer patiently and politely. All the same principles apply when you start writing your bio. Bios are not the place to practice your creativity. We all like to think we're more complex than a two-sentence explanation, but a two-sentence explanation is usually what the world wants from us. Keep it short and sweet. Um, strike all adjectives from your bio. If you take photos, you're not an aspiring photographer, and you're not an amazing photographer either. You're a photographer. Photographer, mother of pearls. <laughs> photographer you're not an inspired you're not a you're not an aspiring photographer you're not an amazing photographer either you're a, pho a photographer Is that... don't get cute don't brag just state the facts one more thing unless you are actually a ninja a guru or a rock star don't ever use any of those terms in your bio ever <laughs> And this quote says, whatever we say, we're always talking about ourselves. Alison Bechdel, Bechdel, B-E-C-H-D-E-L. All right, you guys, we're at the halfway point. I'm going to call it. Um, I don't know when I'm going to go live with this one again next, but it'll be sooner than later. I think tomorrow I'm going to do um, another installment of... Uh, uh, the secret teachings of all ages, but maybe I'll get into this too. We'll see what shakes, but yeah, we really did make the halfway point. That's great. So yeah, this is show your work, 10 ways to share your creativity and get discovered by Austin Cleon. So thank you, Austin. And thank you, YouTube. Thank you, StreamYard. Thank you everyone here with me. I love yous. <laughs> Genevieve. <laughs> oh gosh. I love y'alls. And, um, I'm going to see you very soon. Tomorrow. That's the likeliest time. Mwah. Do it like you feel it. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Have a good one.